Welcome, ladles and jelly spoons, to King's Bishop Teaches Chess. I'm Coach Daniel, your host, also known as King's Bishop here at chess.com. And I'm bringing a commissioned video today. Our sponsor is one of our students, CT43, and he wanted to know how do I play against the London system. And so that's what we're going to focus on in today's video. But first, let's talk about what is the London system. And uh, f before we talk about that, let's talk about what is a system of any kind. A system opening in chess refers to an opening that plays the same standard moves virtually against anything that your opponent plays. Um, there's almost no exception. You can always play the same moves regardless of what they play. And uh, such is the case with the London system. And another good thing about a system opening is that often the move order is not very critical as it is with some other opening lines. And so the benefit of a system is you don't have to memorize a lot of theory and a lot of move sequences. Now, uh, such is the case with the London system, which usually starts with d4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, and the bishop to f4. This is the tabia for the London system. Some players will play the bishop to f4 immediately in the accelerated London system. Regardless of the move order, white's objective with the London system, as with most openings, is to control the center of the board in general. And in the London system, we're focusing on the e5 square in particular, which is why. The pawn is on d4, the bishop is on f4, and that the knight will come to f3, hitting that square as well. In addition to these moves, white will eventually get his pawn on e3, his pawn on c3, his knight on d2, his queen's knight and his bishop either on e2 or d3. The main thing for the London player to remember is if his queen's bishop ever comes under fire. For example, if the knight, which had played to f3, if that knight ever comes to h5 attacking the bishop, you'll want to move that bishop to g3. Or in the event that um, the king's bishop ever attacks your bishop, you'll want to move it to g3. Either case, when that bishop comes under fire, you move it to g3, so that in the event that he should capture, you can capture with your h-pawn and open this file for your rook. And then in that event, which is very unlikely, I'll want to forewarn you, but in the event that that ever happens, you'll then put your queen on c2, sometimes e2, and then queenside castles so that you can work over here on this open file. So that's the gist of the London system um, from White's perspective. That's all he really has to remember. It's very solid. And a lot of people are annoyed by it, including CT43, which is why he sponsored this video. Well, what do we play against the London system? How do we, how do we deal with it if we're black? And that's exactly what we're going to talk about here um, today. So let's go ahead and um, reset the board, get these markings off. Uh, let's flip the board on over so that we can view it from uh, Black's perspective and talk about uh, how we should play when we're facing the London system. So, well, 
let me first mention that whether you're a d5 player or whether you are a knight f6 player, you can transpose one way or the other. If you're a knight f6 player and you're a player plays a London system, simply transpose and play d5 after that. And so uh, the it, it won't you won't get caught off guard if you're a uh, an Indian player. You can you can still play it and then just don't play your usual Indian defense. If they play um, knight f3 to begin with, this is the only caveat. If you're like me and, and your favorite is the old Indian, well, here you know normally um, when knight uh, f3 comes out, normally you're going to play either d6 or g6 if you're an old Indian player or if you're a king's Indian player, g6. But if you're concerned about the London, then you'll want to play uh, e6 and go into a East Indian type of setup. Now, note, it's not really truly an East Indian game if they don't play C4, but that's the setup you're going to want to play so that you can kind of have your opponent tip his hand and commit to the London system so that then you can play uh, D5. Uh, these moves are not as critical, the move order. So if you're a, if you're a D5 player or if you're a knight, f6 player you can play these moves in virtually any sequence and um still come to the same exact uh, position and so when you get this set up typically white plays his pawn to e3 and you're going to want to put your bishop pawn on c5 and attack the center here um that will compel him to play c3 at that juncture. Now, remember I said that the move order is not overly critical for white, but here, once this pawn is coming under attack, it's very likely he'll play c3 to bolster the center here. Now, at this juncture, um, we can play our bishop to d6. We already know, based on what I said a moment ago, that he'll play to g3 we get our knight to c6 and note that we're just developing normally and we're fighting for the center here we're getting a lot of control here we're also looking at the e4 square um because it's clear that once you get your pieces developed correctly no ground will be made on the e5 square this is where white will develop his queen's knight. We will castle. He'll bring his bishop out. And then here we want to get this bishop out. Well, there's only one way to go because we cannot um, relinquish the defense of our bishop. So we'll play b6 followed by bishop to um, b7. And that's going to be your basic idea playing black uh, against the London system. And so you'll want to definitely keep this, this pattern in mind. You're going you're gonna to make these two pawn chains that have a summit here toward the center of the board, and you're just going to develop your pieces to their prime squares, and you'll be ready to go. He'll no doubt castle here, and you can play bishop b7. And a lot of things can happen from here. We're going to actually see a game between Sergei Karyakin and Mickey Adams that was played at the Tata Steel International Tournament uh, back on January 27th, 2016. Tata Steel being a a big famous event formerly known as Chorus, before that known as Hoogavens. Basically, the sponsorship has changed over the years as the company has traded hands over the years. Uh, regardless of its name, it's been the big tournament in the Netherlands annually each year. And in 2016, 
um, Kardiakin played a London system against Mickey Adams, and we're going to use that as an example of uh, how to play from the black perspective. So let's take a look at that game. Actually, before we do that, let me retract this last move. Once your opponent castles his king, there's no need to um, worry about opening the h file. So before playing bishop to b7, you can go ahead and trade off this bishop and then play bishop to b7. Uh, the reason for having left that bishop there previously again was we didn't like a rook bearing down on an open file but now that's not a problem go ahead and make that trade and then develop your queen's bishop to b7 and we go forward from there all right with that let's go to the game between kardiakin and mickey adams Again, this was played in 2017 at the Tata Steel Tournament, which that year, for whatever reason, was played at Utrecht, Netherlands. It's usually played at Vikanze, but that year at Utrecht. doesn't really matter where it was played because the moves are the same no matter where you play them, right? So again, here we have um, an Indian game, which is what I play in response to D R. But again, it doesn't really matter because you can transpose here with D5 afterward. And so Karyakin developing his bishop to F4 in the accelerated London fashion and Adams going ahead with d5. And here Kardiakin does not play knight f3 as expected, but he plays e3, which again, in a system opening, the move order is not very critical. And so we play our e6 as planned. Establishing our nice strong pawn chain here. Now he develops the king's knight. And hopefully you remember that c5 is your move. He's never going to take this pawn. Uh, sometimes people, well, why wouldn't he take the pawn? No, because then you're capturing it with tempo, with development. And you're more than happy to do that. No, they'll. Bring the knight out, they'll bring the pawn out, as in this example. They'll follow those moves prescribed in the introductory remarks of this video. And here we play knight c6. You can play bishop d6 right away. He plays queen's knight to d2, and now bishop d6. And again, he's not going to capture here. Capture is to relinquish the center, and we're ready to play pawn e5 and really dominate in the center in this event. So, the correct way to play, and of course, the play that Kardiakin made was bishop g3. And again, we do not want to capture here and open the, the file for the rook. That would be hazardous to our health. Instead, simply castle. He develops his king's bishop. We open the door for our queen's bishop. And here, Kardiakin played knight to e5. And we're not recommending a move like this to beginners, intermediates, and other amateurs. Remember, there are three goals that you should be looking to accomplish in the opening of the game. Number one, control the center. 
Number two, wake up your pieces and get them out of bed. And number three, castle your king. Now, perhaps White would desire to keep the hope alive of an open H file. The simple approach here is to play queen e2 so that you can castle to the queen side. And after bishop b7, uh, there are other lines that you can consider. Now, you might castle to the queen side here if you're white. Um, or you may just keep your options open. Remember when the center of the board is closed, you don't have to be in a hurry to castle. So most of the top level players here will play rook to d1, saying, I am going to castle eventually to the king's side, but I'm going to get my last piece into the game. If queen side castles, then we have the idea of c4 and continuing in that vein trying to expand against the position of our opponent's king. That will eventually happen in this game. But uh, Kardiakin with knight to e5 before any of this happens, leave these premature attacking moves to the masters, guys, and simply develop your pieces. For black, he follows through with his plan. And now f4 is played. Quite an interesting move, this. What is the purpose of this move, do you suppose? So the purpose of f4 is to reinforce and attack again the e5 square. Basically, white is saying the battle for e5 is over, and I have won that battle. And he has. So that puts black in a situation where he needs to find some other battleground upon which to fight. He cannot overcome on the e5 square. Well, you'll note that the only square left for which to fight is the e4 square now. We've got some control over it, but not enough. We, we can't play to e4 because he has two attackers and we have but one defender. And so for that reason, Mickey Adams plays knight to e7, x-ray attacking or defending, depending on your perspective, the e4 square. Now the point is I can come to e4 because I'm no longer overpowered. And once I get this knight out of the way, I can re-engage on e5 by playing on to f6, kicking away this knight and gaining more control on the e5 square. So though white has said the battle for e5 is over, not so fast, Lee Corso, not so fast. I'm going to play here, then here, then I'm going to send your knight away. And I've got this support uh, to accomplish that task. Well, white then plays queen f3, saying not so fast to you. You've added a, another defender. I'm going to add another attacker. Remember, more attackers than defenders overpower. But if you don't have more attackers than defenders, uh, 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 no overpower. And that's exactly what um, Kardiakin is saying right here. Then we have knight f5. 
interesting move. I want you to think about this move and what is the purpose of knight f5? What is the idea? What in the world is Mickey Adams going after here? So the purpose of knight to f5, again, is to exert control over the e4 square. Black is planning to move his bishop away so that he can put his knight on d6 and have many pieces aiming at that critical e4 square. This is a move that a lot of um, amateurs, particularly beginners, are a bit reluctant to play because they are worried about doubling pawns and things like that. They're worried about a move like bishop takes knight. But bishop takes knight would really be a mistake for white because that completely relinquishes control of e4 to, to black. And at some juncture, we're going to plant this knight right here, not fearing a capture where we will then recapture with our pawn. And then we'll use our bishop on this diagonal. And so, frankly, uh, that just is not a realistic fear. And if your opponent ever plays such a move, you're you're more than happy. It's worth the doubled pawn for the control you get uh, over the center of the board. And so that's why in this game, we actually saw the move bishop f2 by Sergei Karyakin. And the point of bishop f2, uh, he he's, first of all, the bishop's not needed any longer here because... White has adequate control on e5, but it's pretty evident that he wants to expand on the king side and come after Black's king. Now, honestly, uh, Black went ahead and continued his plan. And so this is not to force the knight away. This is because... That's where the knight wanted to go anyway. This is strictly an attacking move by white to try to expand on the king's side and come after the black king. But honestly, at, at your level, at the amateur level, it, it's time to say, all right, I need to get my king castled. And so castling here would probably be preferable. You're no longer fearing anything here on g3. The bishop's out of the way. And uh, the game can go on from there. Of course, black will still play knight d6, and the battle for e4 will be won by black, where the battle for e5 has been won by white. And uh, now the battle lines will be continue to be drawn as the game goes on. You'll note that this is why a lot of people loathe facing the London. It's, it's a very slow, meticulous process, and it can be arduous. And you've got to be precise. It's positional rather than tactical. Most beginners and amateurs want clear attacking ideas. They don't want to have to grapple. They want to just fight and clear and win. So bishop e7, g4 was played, and knight d6, and mission accomplished by Mickey Adams. And sure enough, g5. But once again, this really just forces black to do what he wanted to do anyway and that's to occupy the e4 square with his knight. 
Now, it's at this juncture that Karyakin played a new move, a move that had never been played before in the history of master-level chess. It's what's called the chess novelty, for those of you uh, who want to know the, the jargon. He queenside castled, and the point of queenside castling, of course, is to get the king way over here and bring his pieces over here so he can continue to attack on the king's side. But usually, queen h3 has been played here in chess history, and um, black will usually respond with rook c8 and continue about his business as well. Here, um, Karyakin goes ahead and queenside castles. And I want to put the question to you. Um, what should black do? But before I do, I, I want to say this. Um, yeah, I, I spilled the beans here. <laughs> I didn't mean to uh, disclose black's next move. Yeah, he just played... Pawn to c4 attacking the bishop and um, trying to expand on his own because his storm is coming on the queen's side. Black's storm is coming on the king's side. Now, uh, Kardiakin played bishop to c2. A year after this game, this same position was reached at the Moscow Women's Championship in a game between uh, Lyudmila Tsaitseva and Alexandra Dimitrova. And uh, Tsaitseva took this knight here. But in this game, Karyakin with bishop c2. He's wanting to maintain some eyes over here because the queen will get to h3 in due time. In fact, after b5, queen h3 does get played too late. Too late, but it does uh, get played here. And b4, a very wonderful move by uh, Adams. Just wanting to open things up here. And uh, let's talk about and let you think about how, um, how should white handle this or what should white try uh, to go forward here. By the way, before I do that, who can tell me why not take this three-way fork why not take the three-way fork? I, I want you to think about that before we look at white's next move. We definitely do not want to play knight takes bishop, because that would bring out Captain Blunderpants. Why? Well, even a blind caveman should be able to see that that allows queen takes pawn checkmate. Blunder. Uh-oh. And yeah, this knight is terminally pinned to the h7 square. And so you have to be careful not to go off half-cocked. Make sure when you're considering an attack that you identify your opponent's continuation. And one of the easiest blunders to play, one of the easiest visualization errors to make is failing to visualize the absence of a piece. And that's often where I blunder when I fail to visualize the absence of a piece. So do be careful about that. So instead, uh, b4 was played by Michael Adams, and knight takes the knight. If pawn takes the pawn, 
then we will continue our attack and we're going to open up lines either on the B file or on the A file. He went with knight takes on E4 and pawn takes on E4 is very important to understand. And again, I, I probably should have paused here as well. Uh, to let you think about this, uh, how to how to uh, capture this knight, because an amateur is so afraid of doubling pawns, and it is true that doubled pawns can be weaknesses, but it's not always going to be a problem. And in this example, you don't want to use your knight. Remember, White's entire plan is to break open the king's um, shield here. And one means by which he wants to accomplish that task is by making a pawn break here. And if that uh, knight is not here, that pawn break becomes definitely a real threat. So capturing with the pawn. Furthermore, you don't want to move into yet another pin. The capturing with the pawn makes the most sense uh, in this position. And Karyakin with bishop to e1, adding support here. Bishop d5 now secures all of this structure. And granted, the bishop takes up the role of a tall pawn. But in this case, it's necessary, it is secure. And now queen a5 is a winning threat. That is just very, very, very strong. Um, probably white should capture this pawn, which again is going to be answered by pawn a5. But Karyakin decided to play rook g1. Seems more hopeful to take the pawn. But even then, I'm going to play a5. And if you play b4, I'm going to play a4. And I've got my pawn storm working for me. I could also perhaps play c3 here and try breaking things up this way. And after pawn, a uh, bishop takes pawn, then pawn a5. And even taking here might seem natural, but then I can bring in my knight. And sooner or later, everything's gonna collapse on the, the white uh, king's position. Well, rook g1, and what's the threat or purpose of rook g1. I want you to think about that. What is the purpose of rook g1? The idea behind rook g1 seems to be to play rook g4 followed by rook h4. And um, that's a potential threat with which black must be concerned. Adams played b3, a beautiful move, because it forces pawn takes. You know, he has ideas of wanting to come up and attack on this line. But um, there are potential moves that... Uh, by by white that will thwart such an idea in this event now we just get that a man out of there so there's never going to be an a3 like for example if i play queen a5 white could just defend here and then if i attack it white can make this pretty solid and there's probably not a sacrifice here. There, the one technique to make these things work is to sacrifice, like here, followed by here. But if, um, if white just lifts one of his rooks, that should hold. This sacrifice no longer works out, I don't think. 
And maybe it can. Actually, this still looks pretty good for black, doesn't it? This still looks really good for black. But it's not as clear from this position. You know, you have to be able to calculate that all the way from back here and see that. Yeah, it looks like it might actually pan out if white had played uh, queen a5 here. This is just so much more direct. It's very compelling. It doesn't require any com calculation at all. You know he has to take that pawn, because if he doesn't, um, you're going to, if he moves the bishop here, for example, bishop b1, you're breaking it up over here. And queen a5 definitely works in this position. So it compels pawn takes the pawn, pawn takes the pawn, and now bishop b1 has to be played. All right, well, that brings us back to this rook move a few moves ago, which Adams ignored with his aggressive b3. But this threat still needs to be answered now that um, there's no more to do on the queen's side immediately. Uh, the, the, the point is any move that you might play like a5 to improve now, uh, these things are a bit too slow because that will give white time to get into the game. And um, so we need to stop the idea. The first thought that comes to mind for me is just knight f5 just holds on to this square. Uh, the problem with knight f5, uh, I mean, it might work. But um, white might have ideas of of coming over here and finding a place to rest here. Again, it's it's an unclear position where counterplay might could. I mean, maybe it doesn't work out for white if he comes here because I I can just continue with my attack over here, probably because this can't be unleashed really. It can never be unleashed. So knight, knight f5 probably actually works as well. But the move that Adams played just gets a double exclam in my book. I would never have found this move. Because it's just not the type of move I would risk. It's the move f5, double exclamation point. Because the point of f5 is it keeps the... Any ideas of counterplay off the board? And I know what you're thinking, because I thought the same thing. Can't he just take that en passant? And the answer is um, yes. Yes, he can and did take it en passant. And um, Bishop takes. And now all of a sudden you've got this pawn defended. You've got this square covered so that rook g4 h4 is not a move. And you can still bring your knight here to add additional support. So granted, some of these other moves are probably still winning. I'm sure a5 is a strong alternate here. I'm just not sure if it's fast enough. For my tastes. But f5, I would have never found f5, to be honest. Um, I would have never played it. I, I just, I would be afraid of opening this line. He did. But I'm not Mickey Adams. And bishop takes rook g4 anyway. Really, he might want to start thinking defensively. But... Rook g4, knight f4. Um, now, let's talk about why did he play rook g4 anyway? Why did he play rook g4 anyway? What's his purpose? What's his plan? What's he want to accomplish? So it seems that white has the idea of trying to contest this bishop's control of h4. He might also be 
wanting to get out of the way of this rook and get it doubled up on the g-file toward black's uh, king. And so there's one good way, we've already talked about it, to um, thwart such an idea and to improve your position, and that's the move knight f5, adding more support here. Karyakin now wanting to bail out of the um, queen side of the board because of black's big attack. It might have been worth a try to play pawn c4, but it's awfully risky opening the file upon which your king stands. And, and so, for example, if I play bishop takes and knight takes, well, then rook c8... And, um, yeah, you've got some challenges in either case. And maybe I can play here. And maybe I can stay over here, but it's uh, surely got to be winning for, for black. Uh, there are many, many ways to continue here. So it probably would have been a fruitless try, but might have been worth a try. Well, he went king d2, queen a5 has the idea of queen a1, queen takes b2, king e2, and bishop takes the knight. Very strong move. It's going to open one file or the other. And in this case, Karyakin uh, decided to open the d-file since that's where his um, rook is standing. Rook a d8. And that threatens, of course, to play bishop c4. Check, which would force the king away from the defense of that rook. Winning the rook and winning the game. Um, he could probably have played bishop c4 check right away and and then brought his rook on over. Maybe play rook. doesn't really matter where you put the king. It's, it's lost. Uh, oh, you can't play king f1, silly. You got a bishop there. Ah. Right? I mean, this is still winning either way. But this has a little bit of extra finesse added to it. Finally get some tactics into this otherwise positional game. King f2. Now queen a1. Bishop d2. Bishop c4. He's not in any hurry to do any pawn grabbing. Um, it's winning either way. There's no wrong way to win a chess game. You can you can grab the pawn with a without any uh, threat of of difficulty. Um, but Bishop C4, Queen H5, now Queen takes. And you've got, of course, a super attack on the bishop. And since the bishop is pinned to the rook, he decided to try to defend with king e1. But Adams takes the bishop anyway. And it was here that Kardiakin resigned because... If you play rook takes rook, then I have queen to c1 check. And just ignore the undefended bishop because after blocks, this is checkmate right here. Bada bing, bada boom. It's a very nice example of how to defeat the London system by Mickey Adams. Now, I don't want to end 
the video here because there's another important line we need to consider. Let's suppose, uh, coming back here, instead of bishop to um, d3, we want to consider the bishop b5 line. This is a, a, a line that um, has been successful, particularly by world champion uh, Magnus Carlsen. And so we want to definitely um, look at this line. How would you answer this move, by the way? I want you to think about that. And then we'll put up a Magnus game against uh, Anand and see how that went. White won that game, but um, I don't want us to fear this line. You can still play it. By the way, there's a game where Gata Komsky just said, okay, I'm going to let you open this up. Uh, not Komsky. Who was Komsky? It was against Gata Komsky. Well, I might have the games mixed up, but where Black went ahead and took this bishop and allowed him to open it anyway, which I don't recommend. A Black emerged victorious. It was either Komsky or someone playing Komsky. I, I can't quite remember. I'd have to look it up. But um, I don't recommend this. Just because it works for somebody doesn't mean you should play it. It probably only worked because white did not exploit the benefit of the rook on the open h file, or he couldn't find a good way to exploit it. All right, so, but let's talk about what you would play in this position, and I want you to think about that for a moment. So I actually found the Komsky game. He was on white. It was Sergei Yudin on black when this position was reached. And um, Yudin won this game. Well, what did he play? Now, personally, I prefer the move knight e7 here. We'll talk more about that a little bit later in the video. But Udine went with bishop takes bishop. And, and as I mentioned in the introductory remarks, that's exactly what white wants. Because h takes bishop, and you have an open line toward black's king although it's not clear exactly how to exploit that and how to go. Well, you deal with queen b6, hitting this bishop, and um, Komsky with bishop takes knight. Now, he, he probably could have and maybe should have played a4 and uh, left the knight there. But he goes with bishop takes knight. And pawn takes bishop, opening the b file. Queen c2 defends the b man. And he did play rook b8, although probably pawn takes pawn here first would have been in order. but. Rook b8, doubling up on this, so I guess it doesn't matter the, the move order, because now white's pretty much compelled to do something about this pawn, and he, he dealt with it with rook b1. And now pawn takes pawn, and c takes pawn. And bishop a6 which says, okay, I know you're not planning on castling, but now you can't castle if you wanted to. But um, white does have a nice square to 
plant his knight on if he so desires, and, and that seems like a desirable move, but Komsky played b4. And queen b5 threatening checkmate. Queen d1 defending against the checkmate. Knight d7. And I'm not real clear on the purpose of knight d7. He can come this way. Let's proceed and find out. g4. Ah. Knight d7 is to make a bid for the e5 square again, and uh, which is also the purpose of king's rook to e8. Now a4 hits the queen probably best to simply secure this pawn structure with a3. a4, now queen d3. Rook b3 hits the queen, queen g6. Now knight h4 hits the queen again. And um, he played queen f6, but really better is queen h6. It might look bad at first, but this is actually a pin. The king can't move to defend the rook. So this knight is pinned, so I'm threatening and hoping to play g5. Chomsky dealt with that by moving the rook to a defended square. And so g5 will not be played. Instead, e5. I said Chomsky dealt with it. This, this is a, an alternate line. This didn't actually happen in the game. Komsky would have had to deal with it with rook h3. And then e5 would be played. And after takes, takes. So queen f6 was what actually was played. I should have had some coffee before starting this segment, apparently. Uh, queen b1, and of course, this is the entire point of opening the h file. The threat is to move the knight and to attack the h7, which is why e5 is now questionable to me. h5 would be a great way to seal off the h file. So that after h uh, g takes h5, this pawn becomes black's best friend. Well, e5 was played, and b5, putting the question here, and at some juncture, d takes e5, is probably coming as well. So c takes b5, a takes b5, bishop c8. And here's d takes e5, and knight takes e5. And here's knight, uh, king's knight to f3. Heating up the h7 on. Um, he went ahead and gave check because, after all, check cannot um, be answered with queen takes h7. He, he would have to capture this knight. But he had an alternate. He could have just put the question to the enemy queen. And if takes, then you can take 
and you should be okay here as well. Of course, check has to be answered. And Komsky answered it with G takes F3. And it probably would have been better to answer with knight takes f3. Getting the knight further into the game. g5 is being threatened. Queen takes h7 is being threatened. It puts um, some, some real heat on black he probably has to play g6 so that after g5 he can retreat and not worry about this pawn well g takes f3 was played h6 and rook to h5 d4 of course, you've got this pin here. And e4 was the way he answered it. Another possible move would be probably queen b2, saying if you take. Well, yeah, I could play. I can't really queen takes f6, though, because. We check first, so never mind, it doesn't really work. If you play takes, white checks first. Well, no, that doesn't help because black still gets out of the trouble. Oh, you know what? I'll take this way with check. That's, the, that's what to do. And I gain a piece. E4. That coffee is calling more and more. Bishop e6. And he really needs to play rook d3 to keep this game within his grasp. But instead he played rook b4. And now rook bc8. e5, maybe king d1 would have been worth a try. Queen f4. And now g6 is looming. Queen b2. Now queen e4 would be his last ditch here, I would think. But white's probably still losing. After rook c1 check, because he never did play king d1. So king e2 is forced, and then I can give check with the pawn, forcing king takes pawn. Then I give check with the other rook, forcing rook d4. Then I capture the rook. And... He takes with the queen, but then bishop c4 check. And black is going to be compelled to give up his queen here. Queen takes. You say, well, why not take with the knight? Well, because then this is open. And rook d1 forces the king away. Let's say king c2. And we don't take this queen here because we have, or do we take the queen? Maybe I can take the queen. Well, there's no wrong way to win a chess game, but I, I'm, th I'm thinking there's got to be a mating sequence here, but maybe it'd be just as fast to take with... Take the queen with the queen. Either way, you're winning, aren't you? Because my rook can come here, and then I can start 
you know what i bring my rook here and then i just ladder checkmate him that's what to do that's what we do well if he plays knight e3 then i've got a different kind of checkmate he has to come to b3 and then we've got this checkmate any other move and i just ladder made him i'll play so let's say he comes here i'll play here and uh yeah here here next no matter what he plays doesn't matter what he plays all right so in, uh, in any case he wouldn't be able to take with the knight he'd have to take with the queen and after rook takes it should be pretty elementary from here white is trying to fight with a rook and a knight against a queen that's eight points against nine but black also now has one extra pawn and his pawns are much healthier than these scattered isolated pawns that white has anyway none of that came into being because queen b2 was played king's rook to d8 b6 pawn takes pawn king f1 rook a8 rook f5 hits the queen but it's inconsequential bishop takes rook pawn takes bishop queen takes pawn and white resigned in that position and we'll go ahead and put this into my computer and let the computer play the computer and then I'll show the Carlson Anand game and we'll we'll see what happened there and where it went awry for Anand who was on the black side. So the next game I show will be a win for white. But let's look at the end of this game. This game is over, but what could have happened and we'll use the computer to emulate that. So here's a game where Magnus Carlsen is playing against Vishy Anand. It was at Doha, Qatar, December 30th, 2016. You'll see in the move order um, over, uh, over here, there, uh, that the move order was different, but we reached the same position. Uh, if you like, we can just go through the different move order. You'll note that Vichy's playing an Indian game. Uh, but as I mentioned in the initial remarks, you can just, as soon as bishop C4, uh, f4 is played, you can just transpose immediately. And so e3, c5, c3, knight c6, Knight d2, e6, King's knight f3, bishop d6, bishop g3, castles, bishop b5. So we have the same idea, the same basic setup, different move order. And so keep that in mind. What we're looking for as black is our pawn shield intact here. 
our expansion over here and all our pieces develop. That's all we're looking for is black. Now, here at this juncture, Anand played a6, and as I mentioned in the previous game, I really prefer knight e7 here, and we will get to the knight e7 move. We'll show an example, or a couple of examples perhaps, of knight e7. Anand with a6. Bishop takes the knight. Pawn takes the bishop. Queen a4. Rook b8. And so we have some similar ideas as in the previous game. And you're always going to get these ideas with this setup if you play this line, this captures line. Queen a3. And now because of... Uh, well, let me think here. Is our, okay, we cannot play... Yeah, we cannot play a discovered attack because we're super attacked. So this becomes a pin. So you might like to play a, a c4, but you can't because of that discovery. If you were to play c4, bishop or, or queen takes bishop either way. And so here Anand gives up the h-file also. As we saw uh, Gatikomsky do. I mean, uh, Yudin did against Komsky. And again, I'm not recommending this. But in this position, it's certainly understandable. You want to play c4, but you cannot. So he's... He, seems to feel compelled to do so and obviously then this this is playable i'm just i'm simply not recommending it you're giving white exactly what he wants okay so c takes d4 c takes d4 and here a5 was played and as i mentioned you know the the thematic move when you have this setup is queen b6 and, and make your battery against the b-man. But a5 and Magnus says, this is really of no value to me. I don't have a good way to exploit it. You might wonder, well, what about just bringing the queen over? Well, you'd have to get rid of this knight, and you also have to be concerned with your b-man. So he went ahead and castled. And um, so that's, that's interesting to me. It invites bishop a6 with tempo against the king's rook. But that's not what uh, Vichy played. He went with queen b6 now, a move later. And then b3... But um, bringing the rook, you know this. You know this bishop is coming here anyway. So bringing the rook over anyway might be the more active approach. But b3, and yeah, now bishop a6 is played, and yeah, now rook f c1 is played. And the rook f c1 has the idea of bringing the queen to d6, so that this pawn can be super attacked and for that reason knight d7 is not uh, probably advisable because that invites this super attack with a fork and that's what was played so more promising would be knight g4 rather than knight d7 Perhaps uh, you could play bishop b5 and just defend this pawn. Since the b file has been rendered useless anyway at the moment. Okay, well, knight d7 it was, and that of course invites 
the very strong queen d6. And now the, the knight has to be dealt with. Anand defends with queen a7. More flexible is to defend with queen d8. But you're losing this pawn in either case. And then the bishop has to move. Well, queen a7, rook did take the pawn, bishop did move. And now rook c7. Of course, this is defended, but rook b7. And now the rooks are doubled on the open c file. And He'll trade and then bring in the next rook. A4 was played, and sure enough, rook takes rook, queen takes rook, rook c7, queen b8, and there go two miners for a rook. Rook takes, bishop takes, and but but he resigned. As you can see, the queen's going to capture. And this is enormously advantageous for white. Three, three pieces against two. And he's got a passed pawn. Uh, should I take this with the knight? Then I can get the knight into the game and also have a passed pawn still. And yeah, um... Well, let's put it into the computer and let the computer play it out and see what happens. And then I'll show a game where Sergei Karyakin defeated Magnus Carlsen in the Bishop B5 line. I know you want to see how that unfolded. So we're going to go back to the move bishop b4. And uh, the move order here is also slightly different. Uh, d4, knight f6, bishop c, uh, f4, d5, e3. And in this time, Karyakin played e6 rather than the c5 that we saw from Vishyanand. But again, the move orders will vary in the system type of openings. Now c5, c3, knight c6, queen's knight d2, bishop d6, bishop g3, castles, and bishop b5. Uh, this game was played the year prior to the Anand game against uh, Sergei Karyakin, uh, who you probably know challenged uh, Magnus for the world title and lost. 
Uh, this was played at Berlin, Germany on October 13th, 2015. And Kardiakin answers with A6, as we saw from Anand. And again, we're going to recommend Knight E7. And we'll get to at least one example of that uh, after this game. So A6, and Bishop takes Knight, and Pawn takes Bishop. Now, knight e5 was played here. As you probably recall, queen a4 was the improvement that Magnus played against Vichy uh, the following year. But again, this was the year before. Knight e5, queen c7, knight d3, pawn c4. Bishop takes the bishop, queen takes the bishop, knight c5. Now e5, and that opens the door for his light squared bishop, and attacks the center. So a good, nice, strong move. b3, c takes b3, a takes b3, opens the a file for his rook. And... Um, Rook e8, wanting to open the e file. I don't know if it's more important to challenge this outposted knight, but um, doing so with knight d7 is probably more prudent. And if takes, you take with your bishop. Rook e8, though, as you can see, the idea is, well, my opponent's king is uncastled. Let me open the E file. But of course, Magnus castles. And now Knight G4. And I'll be honest, I'm not real clear. Oh, I see. He wants to get a checkmate threat with pawn takes pawn. So g3 was played to stop that threat, but probably the best way is to simply kick that knight out with h3. Note that g3, you do create weaknesses here, and that could be problematic later. Well, queen h6 immediately attacks h2 again anyway, so that compels h4. Rook a7, king g2, and that queen's rook now doubles up on e7. And of course, pawn takes pawn now would pack a winning punch because that opens that battery up to the e file. Knight f3 by Magnus. Now note that this is under super attack, but you don't really want to take that here. Because after knight takes the pawn, black is going to unleash his battery with pawn takes d4. And um, even though you can play knight c7 here, and you don't fear rook takes knight. And the reason you don't fear rook takes knight, well, actually. Why not? You could play rook takes knight, to be honest. Um, because white doesn't really have a good refutation to rook takes knight. So never mind that. Um, you do fear rook takes knight. Probably best here to just take this. But nonetheless, the, the real point I'm trying to get to is note this peace relationship. And you just want to take this pawn, but not here because it's defended. So you take it with your rook. And that's really the point I wanted to get to, regardless of whether this is a, a move. This is definitely a move. And you cannot take without losing your queen. And so um, you don't want to go pawn grabbing there and allow that uh, battery to be unleashed 
So knight f3 was played, and now e4. Now you may wonder, well, why can't he still just play this? Well, because queen takes, and now this has no teeth. So e4, attacking the knight, and knight h2, knight takes knight, king takes knight. g5, trying to open up the h file now. Rook h1 says, Zymine and Gost, I'll step away with a discovered attack on your queen. He does take, but then king g1 pins the pawn and h3. Now in h3, as I've said many, many times before, your, keep your friends close and keep your enemies closer. He should just blockade that pawn and take refuge in front of it. That would be the best way to keep this game equal. Instead, Magnus did go for this pawn now. After all, it's twice attacked and only once defended. But Kardiakin found the very strong rook a7. And after knight c5, rook takes rook, attracting the queen away from the d1 h5 diagonal, allowing... Bishop to g5, taking possession of that open diagonal. And now black has a nice advantage in terms of peace, mobility, and activity. King h2 now, queen f6. Looking to play queen f3, queen h, uh, g2 checkmate. Queen b2. Now, probably the better way to defend is to get your queen over here and just completely say, okay, I've blown this. I just need to try to hold on for dear life. But a queen f1 has its own problems. For example, queen f1, and I may just play rook a8. Although white could block that off and, and close everything down. Um, then I can come to b8 and go after that pawn. Um, of course, if you do, then white can defend. So there may be some fruitlessness on black's part on the queen's side if you, uh, if you play that line. Well, queen b2 by Magnus and queen f3, and black really has a strong attack here, threatening mate. So rook g1 is the only way to defend, but now rook a8, and he needs to close that file off. Instead, he played c4, which uh, is a big mistake because it grants access to the rook. However, uh, Sergei Kardiakin did not appreciate the value of rook a1 here. Now, he didn't play that. He played king g7. Now, why can I play rook a1? Well, both the queen and the rook are overworked. An overworked piece is a piece that has too many jobs to do. So, in other words, the queen, obviously, if you take with the rook, it's checkmate and one. What may not be as obvious is that if you take with the queen, it's checkmate in three because of queen takes pawn check with no longer being defended. And then after king h1, bishop f3 check, only one legal move, and there's your magic square checkmate. Sergei Karyakin, the world championship challenger, didn't see this. Now, you should know that both players were on very short time at this point in the game. They were both in time struggles. Whereas I had quite a bit of time to look this over. So a lot of times the clock can really play havoc. But what's really surprising here is how many times Sergei gets a chance to play Rook A1 and, and doesn't take it. Uh, so he played king g7, and 
Magnus gives him the second bite at the apple by taking this pawn. And again, obviously the same exact combination is available. But he missed that second chance. And now the third chance. And he missed that third chance. And again, the time, uh, the clock was certainly a factor in these three strikes by Karyakin. But what's amazing here is after knight a6, hitting the rook and rook b6, hitting the knight and knight c7, here Karyakin does recognize that the queen is overworked. And he takes the pawn. So what's, what's mind-boggling is that he sees it here, but he doesn't see it in the three previous examples. And wait till you see what happens. Queen a2, rook a4, again. But uh, he could have still... He recognizes the queen's overworked somehow, but he doesn't recognize that he can exploit that with rook to the first rank which is the same winning idea that I showed in those three previous examples. So, rook a4, queen b2, and again, rook a1 is available for the fourth time, but he's still blind to the tactical safety of rook a1, and he retreats the rook. So there's something strangely... Um, strangely obstructing Karyakin's view. Maybe he doesn't recognize that the rook itself is overworked. I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is a very clear checkmate threat. So this, this rook is absolutely anchored on g2. So it's a bit surprising. Nonetheless, he doesn't see his fourth chance at rook a1 and his fifth chance at the first rank. Now knight e8 check, king g6, knight c7, pawn h5. Um, can you play it here? What does he have if I play it here? Oh, he has the queen. He has queen b6, so you can't play it now. Now it's not available because of queen b6. Queen b6 is checked. So h5, queen c2, king h7, queen b2. Now there's no more queen check. And so, again, here's the fifth chance at rook a1. Missed. <laughs> rook c1, rook back to f3. Rook back to g1. And now the sixth chance for rook a1 overlooked. Queen f5. Rook back to c1. Rook to a7. Knight to e8. Queen back to f3. Threatening the mate, so forcing the rook back to g1. And actually now you rook a... Uh, one is not available again because of uh, knight f6 check. So queen, um, rook a6, queen c2, rook e6, uh, and Magnus lost on time. Although the game is now lost in either case. Because once you move the, the, the knight, the only safe square for the knight at the moment is c7. But then you'll note this queen becomes overworked again. And so I can just play rook c6, forking the queen and the knight. And once the queen moves to safety, let's say queen d2, I grab that knight. And then I have um, the same threat as before. So it doesn't really matter whether he plays queen b2, queen a2, whatever. I still have rook c1 with the same checkmate that I, I showed earlier.
Oops. Uh, so sorry. He's not going to go there because that's checkmate. Um, he's going to go here. Then he'll come here because it's forced. And bada bing, bada boom. So uh, there you have an example where Kardiakian still won the game. Let's come back to that key position that we're looking at the lines that involve bishop b5. We already showed the, the idea behind bishop d3 and how to go. But bishop b5 might be more of a concern. And I've been urging knight to e7. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, but stand by. I've got a game or two more that I want to show you. And uh, we will bring knight to e7 out as an example. And uh, that's coming right up here in a moment. So now we have another game from the Doha Qatar event. This was actually played two days prior to the Anand game that we showed earlier at the same event. Um, his opponent, Grandmaster Anton Korobov. Now, I'm not real familiar with Korobov, so I looked him up and found out, first of all, he was born June 25th, 1985, and secondly, that he's a four-time Ukrainian chess champion. So, I mean, these days it's really hard to keep track of the different grandmasters. But um, I thought we'd just uh, go right back to the starting position here to see another move order. D4, D5, Bishop F4, C5, E3, Knight C6, C3, Knight F6, Knight D2, E6, Knight G, F3, Bishop G. Uh, d6, bishop g3, kingside castles, and now again bishop b5. And so just emphasizing once again that the move orders will vary, but we have the same plan no matter what when the London is um, brought to bear upon us. And now we finally get to see a line featuring knight e7. And Bishop D3 by Magnus Carlsen, which brings us back to a similar situation to what we showed right at the get-go of this um, program. Now B6, and you've got your nice little mountain of pawns on the queen side, which is what you're going for. E4. Now bishop takes g3 anyway, and you know my opinion about that. Uh, I, I consider this move ill-advised as it opens the h file, especially when you've already got two long-range attackers eyeballing the h7 square. So I would prefer to continue with uh, d takes e4, which compels knight takes pawn. And after knight takes knight and bishop takes knight hitting my rook, I can block that with knight d5. I don't fear the attack on the pinned knight uh, because I'm going to answer that with a counterattack f5. And uh, so that should be fun to play. We don't mind doubling pawns and opening the f file. So in the event of, for example, pawn takes, well, that's just a, a mistake by white. It gives us way too much initiative. Um, yeah. If he plays bishop takes here, then of course we'll take the bishop and that exposes his king. So he'll have to castle. And then you can go with your usual scheme. And uh, what else? Uh, if he retreats his bishop, um, bishop d3, well, now we can move our knight 
and uh, wear Jim Dandy. All right, so that's my preference. Just so you know the direction, I'm really encouraging you to go when you're facing the London. Uh, but we should see these other lines, and black does win this line. So uh, apparently bishop takes is playable, but I, I honestly think that this gives uh, white an advantage. I just, I don't like the idea uh, of opening this line. And I even like this less, opening this line. Now, I know you're thinking, well, he can, if you don't take him, he can open the line anyway. Uh, true, but I don't like being the one to initiate that open line. Uh, instead, I would play knight g6 and make him open the line on his move. Make him spend the move to do it. And uh, then we can play knight g4 here. And if he plays knight h4, our knight will come back, fleeing the attack. And we're ready to jump in here at the right moment. And our king is fairly well bolstered here. I'd still give the edge to white, to be perfectly honest, because I just think we've given him too much with this h file. But uh, D takes by Korobov. Knight takes the E man. And now that the D5 square has been vacated, it actually makes more sense to me to play the knight to e uh, D5 rather than knight G6. But knight G6 is what Anton Korobov played. And Magnus, on the other hand, overlooks the availability of the e5 square. He played pawn takes uh, c5. But notice that um, knight to e5 um, is, a, is a strong move threatening knight c6. That's going to be a winning move. And so that would compel bishop b7 to prevent such a move. But now knight takes pawn, uh, knight takes knight uh, check, compels queen takes knight, which wins the exchange. So as you can see, white really had a chance there. Instead, Magnus played pawn takes c5. Bishop b7, knight takes knight check here, queen takes the knight, pawn takes the pawn, e5, and e4 is the threat, threatening to fork, so white has to prevent that fork, he does so by trading the bishop off for the knight. And Karabov captures, and we always say capture toward the center, but there are exceptions. Remember, all principles have their exceptions. And here we have a very, 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 very good reason to capture with the F-man, because it unleashes this wonderful um, battery on the open F-file. So I would prefer F-takes in this particular and specific case. But H-takes by... Or both. Queen d7. Now that does hit the bishop, but I prefer to take this pawn first, attracting the rook to um, a7, and then play the queen, because now that creates a nice pin, giving the queen d7 sharper teeth. Uh, nevertheless, Magnus with queen d7. Now queen takes the pawn on b6. And I think bishop takes knight would be preferable because pawn takes bishop is answered by queen takes pawn, and that attacks the undefended rook. And after white plays queen h3, both defending the rook and threatening Queen h7 or queen h8 checkmate, 
Well, black actually has a nice out by playing pawn to f5 cuts the queen off from coming in here and gives the uh, king a nice runaway square so he's hakuna matata well queen takes pawn was played and now knight to g5 was played and uh, i don't care for that move i consider that Captain Blunderpants! Because it gives Black the initiative with Bishop takes the hanging G man. And um, so Queen H3 threatening mate is still the best and correct move to play. And uh, after f6 and queenside castles, um, yeah, white's getting his pieces into the game and looking good. Black still has plenty of play here as well, again, because he's got an escape square. But it's a little bit precarious. We, we probably have to take equal control of the d-file here to keep the game in hand so that we, we don't allow a rook d7. Uh, but this should be equal. Um, white can also just castle first, and um, it's much stronger than the knight g5 option that, that Magnus played. And sure enough, bishop takes g2 is played, and queenside castles, and now... Queen's rook to b8, threatening checkmate on the next turn. Now note that taking is an error. The importance of the bishop taking this pawn was not to attack the rook, but to defend against queen h3. And so taking would be a, a, a stone-cold blunder, because after rook takes, there's no move that black has to prevent Queen h3, and with the knight here, doesn't matter where this pawn goes, uh, checkmate will be delivered with queen h7 or queen h8. Now, if you say, well, I will then block the queen from going to h3, well, that loses in a different direction because now this diagonal is wide open and I can simply play queen d5 check. And, uh, yeah, it's mate after you block. Or if you want to give your queen away first, you can stall one move longer. Either way, you're mated. All right, so taking the rook would be a blunder. So rook A, B8, threatening checkmate is absolutely the smartest move. And black is in control. Magnus tried b3. Whether b4 is a better defense is uh, debatable because then black can move his rook over here, attacking the backward uh, c man. And meanwhile, the f man is also still under attack. And so that if white tries to defend the c man, Queen takes a uh, pawn check will uh, will be really strong. And after rook d2, defended by the queen, um, well, queen takes g3. And white has just too many targets that are hanging. And black should win this game fairly easily. Uh, so whether b4 is any better is certainly debatable, but after b3, queen takes the f-man in either case, still wanting to avoid capturing that rook for the same reason mentioned a moment ago. So queen takes, and queen g4, and Magnus is just going for um, last-ditch hopes. Uh, probably hoping for queen h4 followed by mate. Um, 
But rook f c8 is a is a great move, and, and black's clearly winning. He's going to give check here and uh, win the game. And so king b1, he doesn't have time to play here saying, okay, I'm going to mate you. Actually, queen h8 mate. Uh, the reason he didn't have time is because it allows a forcing checkmate sequence. I want you to see this. Uh, because you should really understand how to give checkmate with all these major attackers lined up. And so I want to put that on the board. You can pause if you like to try to figure it out. But the answer is um, rook takes on with check, forcing the king to b1. And then you use your other rook uh, to unleash your attack. Doesn't really matter. You can use either rook because both are, are check threatening mate. So it doesn't really matter which rook you use. You can use the B man, the B rook, or the C rook. Either way, he's forced to capture. And then we're capturing with check. And then doesn't matter which way he goes, you have a magic square check mate. And so for that reason, queen uh, H4 is not possible he played king b1 and black captures the pawn in either case still threatening the checkmate uh, continuation and magnus makes one cute final last ditch effort to uh, trick his opponent he plays queen b4 and the point is uh, you cannot take the queen without um, well even a blind caveman can see that that allows white to give checkmate. Uh, so one last ditch trick. Uh, Korobov does not fall for it. He simply retreats um, his C rook to C8 and um, Magnus Carlsen uh, resigned right there. Uh, let's go ahead and put that into the computer and let you see one of many possible continuations with the computer playing against itself from this position until checkmate is reached. And then I got one more game to show uh, featuring the um, knight e7 response to bishop b5. So. Hang in there. Okay, so the last game I'm going to show was between Boris Gelfand and Ernesto Inarkiev at Magas, Russia on July 22nd, 2016. Most viewers will recognize Boris Gelfand's name. He was born June 24th, 1968 in the Soviet Union. He now hails from Israel. He was a six-time world championship candidate, six times so far. I'd say he has still chances to qualify again, although the up-and-coming generation seems to be prevailing. Uh, but nonetheless, six-time um, candidate. 
winning the Candidates Tournament of 2011. He was also World Cup winner in 2009. But um, his victory at the 2011 Candidates Tournament qualified him to play and challenge Vichy Anand uh, for the World Chess Championship in 2012. That match ended in a 6-6 tie, which under the old system, you had to defeat the world champion to take away the title, so ties meant that the reigning champion retained his title. Um, but nowadays, if the match ends in a tie, they decide uh, the championship with a playoff, and that playoff was won by Vichy Anand. Um, Ernesto Enarchiev, not as well known, was born on December 9th, 1985, and uh, he's a Russian chess grandmaster, born in uh, Kalmykia and the first ever grandmaster from Kalmykia. He was European champion in 2016, the year this game was played. So a very strong grandmaster indeed. The move order that we have here, let's flip this over. Sorry about that. I should have... Uh, had that flipped over to begin with. Here we have d4, d5, bishop c4, and c5 right away. e3, knight c6, knight f3, e6, c3, bishop d6, bishop g3, knight f6, queen's knight d2, castles, and bishop b5. So, We've seen this position reached from quite a variety of move orders. And um, here, Enarchiev does play my preferred and recommended move, knight e7. And uh, Gelfand playing the same move that we saw in the previous game from Magnus, bishop d3. And here, Enarchiev comes out with queen to b6. An interesting line. Of course, as mentioned, we're recommending uh, b6 followed by bishop b7, but uh, queen b6 should prove interesting, and it give you something to think about as another way to play here. And so rook b1, knight to g6, bishop takes knight, Pawn takes bishop. In this case, we definitely want to capture toward the center, unlike in the previous game where we already had a queen on f6 and capturing with the f-man would have made more sense. So h takes g6, bishop takes bishop, queen takes bishop. Knight e5 on b6 now, queen f3, and bishop a6 instead of bishop b7, a nice way to, at least for the time being, preclude castling. h4 says, I don't want to castle anyway. I want to open things up and get an attack going with this h file. Knight d7, and the idea is to. Um, Get rid of a pawn here, perhaps, to open a, a lineup and then trade off knights and win another pawn with the queen. But uh, knight takes knight before that can happen, obviously, and queen takes the knight. Now h5 is probably a bit premature. You should probably play um, pawn takes pawn first. And then after pawn takes pawn, then h5. But uh, Gelfond with h5 right away. And since white did not pawn takes pawn, black should pawn takes pawn himself, which he does not do. Instead, g5. h6, continuing with his plan, and now f6. And uh, again, pawn takes pawn here seems to be in order, but Gelfand with 
queen h5. Now, bishop d3, a great move, hitting the rook and hitting g6, which would be a winning move for, for white. And um, Gelfond plays pawn takes pawn, and that brings out Captain Blunderpants, because you really need to get this rook moved to d1, to c1 maybe, but it's pretty critical to move that rook. Instead, he captured the pawn, king takes the pawn, and of course, we'd love to get rook h8 played, but queen h6 check pushes the king over to f7, rook to c1, now rook h8. And this looks um, very interesting indeed because black is winning the white queen. There's no way for the queen to be saved, but he's giving up two rooks to do it. And of course, that's an exciting continuation. Now, if you're not comfortable playing a queen against uh, two rooks, you might think that through. Technically, two rooks should be better than a queen in many, many cases. But in this case, because this rook really has no way of getting into the game, the two rooks are not a benefit. And it's important to understand when you can play two rooks against a queen and when you cannot. And really, both rooks really have to be mobile queen by nature is always going to be more mobile anyway and so uh, after king g7 the rook has to move again he played to h1 it's probably more hopeful to keep the rook somewhat active uh, perhaps threaten e4 but rook h1 he really doesn't have any anything he can go after from there queen a4 on a3, on e5, and pawn f3, I thought it'd be better for him to just, all right, I shouldn't have put my rook back on h1. Let me get my pieces into the game. But f3, king g6. Now, rather than king g6, Opening things up should be pretty decisive. E takes d4, for example, and C takes d4. And one possible continuation would be bishop a6 with the idea of getting a checkmate threat going up here. And it's hard for, um, it's hard for white to defend this, to be honest. I don't know what he could do, if anything to fight against queen b5. There's, there's hardly a move that he could play. Uh, even if d takes c5 is played, I'm, I'm playing queen here. I'm not worrying about that pawn because I have a checkmate threat. And that checkmate threat must be answered. So surprising not to see that from a player of the caliber of Anarchyev. Instead, he's queen, king g6 and king f2. Now, d takes e5 first uh, would make a bid for equalization. But, um, and I, I probably just take here and then king f2. But um, he played king f2 right away, and now c4, and once again, since he didn't take you, perhaps you should take him. But uh, c4, e4, and again, probably capturing this pawn would have been a better bet. But e4, e takes d4. E takes d5, now queen b5, 
c takes d4, queen takes d5, rook c3, queen takes d4, check, king e1, pawn b5, king d1, a5, and, and white was never able to coordinate his rooks, and that's why he's losing this game. Rook e1, b4, pawn takes pawn, pawn takes pawn, and then the rook gives itself up for the bishop. And queen takes the pawn. Uh, if he takes with the... Uh, queen takes the rook. If he takes with the pawn... Yeah, it doesn't much matter. Rook e6 isn't going to help much, and I'll, I'll just play queen g1 check. And then you'd have to go back anyway. So, queen takes, and, and plus it's probably better to keep your pawns connected. So, king c1 and b3, threatening mate. And here white resigned because checkmate is. Uh, unstoppable at this juncture. Um, if he says, okay, I'm going to have to come here so I can escape the checkmate, well, now I can play, I'm not going to play the check, give you an out. I'll keep those squares under control and I'll attack your knight, threatening checkmate. And so that compels um, pawn takes pawn. Well, if you play rook to... I said it compels pawn takes pawn, but then we just win with b2 in any, any move. There's only one, two, three, four, uh, and however many legal moves the, the rook has, and every single one of them's answered by promote and, and checkmate. If you try rook e2 saying okay i'll defend um yeah i think i just take here and if you capture now queen f1's actually mate though so you can't capture because the the pawns control is c2 so you can't even capture there there seems to be well, what could he do, if anything? There's really nothing he can do, because wherever he goes, whatever he does, uh, if he comes over here and says, all right, I'm not going to let you in here, well, then I'll come over here. No, even better, I'll come here. I'll come here so that this is um, controlled. That forces the king to e2, and yeah, here we go. That forces the king to e3, and then take your pick of which queen you want to mate with. Uh, you haven't moved this as a queen yet, so you might as well use that one. All right, so uh, several examples now of how to play against the um, London system. And again, the main emphasis that I want to get us to is your... Pawn stack. Get your pieces developed and get your, whether he moves bishop d3 or bishop b5, if he moves bishop b5, get your knight back and then play b6, bishop b7. Otherwise, just play b6, bishop b7 right away. And as you can see, the, you've got a solid game going for you. If you lose the game, it won't be because of the opening. All right, so I hope this um, video has been helpful. If you're interested in lessons, don't forget to contact me in, at my email. And uh, let me put that up for you right now. Exclaim lessons. And there you go, daniel.griner at gmail.com. And um, if you'd like to donate to the program, that would be appreciated. You can find the PayPal link below. Um, and you can also donate at Twitch.
and don't forget to subscribe. So I think that covers it for now. If you have any questions about the London system, you know, I'm not an expert at it, but um, I just studied it for this video that uh, CT43 asked me to create. And uh, But I'll do my best to answer those questions. If there's a particular line, for example, in which you're interested or a particular objection to anything I, I put out, just let me know. All right. Until next time, have a great day and play some great chess. Bye now.